Thank you. Yeah, I feel like I got very heavily trailed yesterday, so no pressure. Um, so it's great to be here. Really nice to see everyone here. This is my second time at a live event that involves FreeBSD. So it's really nice to see a few people that I've seen before and, and some new people as well and people online. I won't think about them. Um, so the talk today, learning as we grow, but I, now I look at it, I wonder if it should be growing as, as we learn, but um, you get the idea. Um, managing FreeBSD infrastructure and laptop projects as two different projects at the FreeBSD Foundation. So I'll just introduce myself for those who <coughs> haven't met me before. Um, my name's Alice Sowerby. Um, I'm currently doing program management for the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, I started that in June this year. So I think I can stop counting in weeks, but I'm definitely still counting in months. Um, and was not involved with the FreeBSD community or project before that, so I'm, I'm kind of new to all of this in that sense. Um, I'm British, I live in the UK, n near to a town called Bath, or a city called Bath, which is, if you know where London is, uh, you just need to go west for about an hour and a half, uh, and that's where Bath is. It's a very nice um, historical city, it's very popular for uh, day trips out of London. There's a Roman, Roman baths and um, Georgian architecture, very famous for Jane Austen. Um, it's, it's lovely, yeah, very, very popular. Um, I'm a freelancer, so I'm, I'm on contract with the foundation currently. Uh, and then just a couple of little facts about what I do outside of work there. I'm mainly driven by what pictures I could find. So you can see gardening, that's where I look like I'm, uh, you know, Second World War land girl. Dancing, that's why I'm doing some Latin dancing, which I like to do Latin ballroom, uh, salsa, Argentine tango, you name it, I'll have a go. Um, this is me at the um, Euro BSD con. I had my picture taken by Olivier. Um, and then just in case anyone wants to talk to me later and you need an icebreaker, you can ask, there's a tiny, tiny picture in the corner here. That's me and my two younger sisters in Checkers. Uh, does anyone know what Checkers is? It's a UK reference. It's a place. It's a stately home. It's the Prime Minister's house. <laughs> so uh, you can ask me why was I there, and I'll tell you the answer, but not, to, not, uh, not as part of this presentation. Um, I have been probably actually closer to 20 than 15 years in, in tech. Um, my career path has been meandering. I spent a good amount of time doing user experience design um, for B2B uh, tech products, um, also including developer products, developer tooling. Um, I've also done product roles, developer relations roles, and operations roles. So just wherever I thought I could be useful is, is I was following my Curiosity. Uh, some companies that I've worked for that you may have heard of, Equinix is, is one, my most recent role, which is um, Program Director for Developer Relations. Um, DDN Storage, where I was uh, working in a, uh, a sort of an incubator startup role, doing operations. Uh, Sophos, that was my, f my first employer in tech, because uh, prior to that I was a high school teacher doing science. So my degree is chemistry, I'm not a technologist. Um, and then I've worked in a couple of different startups. So when Docker got very popular in sort of 2014-ish, I was in a container-based startup, VC-backed, UK-based, but uh, backed out of um, mainly Amer American money. Um, and machine learning ops about five years ago before AI kind of took off. Um, open source-wise, um, Obviously, I'm, I'm now part of the FreeBSD community, but I'm also active in uh, the Chaos community, and those folks who were at Euro, Euro BSD Con may have seen me giving a talk about Chaos there. Um, it's community health analytics in open source software projects, which means that if you have an open source project and you want to understand is it healthy? Is it sustainable? There are things you can measure and then things you can do to see if it makes a difference to those measurements. 
and, and then you can work towards making um, your community a little bit more healthy and sustainable. And it's things like time to first response on tickets um, and, and various things, you know, bug backlog log um, closing and things like that. And then the to-do group is um, part of the Linux Foundation. It's a community of practice for open source program offices. So a lot of large corporations and governments have open source program offices that um, manage their use of open source and engagement with open source projects um, and foundations. So I, um, I'm a book editor for them. And I'm, I produce the podcast for Chaos. Um, so I don't really use social media, but I have put my foundation email address here. And that QR code takes you to LinkedIn, which I do use a bit, not much. So today, um, as, as build, I'll be talking about uh, how the foundation is using targeted investment to deliver specific outcomes for the FreeBSD project, how it's changing its staffing and its processes to manage these projects effectively, and two example projects, which is infrastructure modernization and laptop usability, um, and a deep dive into each one of those to look at the objectives and the benefits of the projects and how we're managing those, because it's slightly different for each one. So let's start by taking a look at targeted investments for specific outcomes. It's exciting. All right, so just a little recap of, of how sponsored projects have worked to date with the foundation. So you probably know better than I, than I do the long history that the foundation has in sponsoring projects, particularly development projects, okay? Um, and you may be familiar with this page on the FreeBSD Foundation website where it lists a lot of the projects that have been sponsored or funded by the foundation. Um, they can be proposed by pretty much anybody. Sometimes they're initiated from within the foundation based on conversations. Sometimes people will write up proposals and we'll go through a, a process of evaluation um, and the funding will come from there. Um, and then funding has generally come from the general donation pool. So um, donations are not generally connected to the work, not generally. And if you see at the top, you can you can see that you know, there's a donate now button and the donors and the donations are all, all totted up there. And that's how it's been done up until now. And this is, this is continuing, that we're not stopping doing it this way. Um, but I'm going to speak a little bit about how we're extending from that model. So it seems as though there's something interesting going on in open source at the moment, which is that there seems to be a ramping up in interest in, in, in investing specifically into open source from various um, sources, right? That, that perhaps were doing it in a more ad hoc manner or, or weren't investing previously. Um, and I've put on the right here um, a screenshot of, of an organization called the Sovereign Tech Fund. Now, this is, something's wrong with this. So I don't know, if does anyone know what, what's wrong with this screenshot? If you've been following the news lately? OK, it's changed its name. It's now called the Sovereign Tech Agency um, because they, it's relatively recently been set up. It's, a, it's about a couple of years old. It's, um, it's a part of the German um, government. But actually, their website is in English. Uh, and they invest in, um, as you can see here, open digital infrastructure. So organizations like the Sovereign Tech Agency um, and um, um, yesterday, I think Ed mentioned the Alpha Omega project, which was part of, um, comes under the Linux Foundation, are now looking to invest specifically rather than just to donate. So that they're trying to influence um, or support certain key attributes of the open source ecosystem that maybe had previously been 
left a chance. So things like security and diversity within um, the infrastructure. Um, so as I alluded to, it is more government and NGO-led than commercially driven, although there are certainly some um, commercial investments. Um, the, the difference between just general donations and this type of investment is that the investment is much more structured and the bodies that are investing are not necessarily see, looking at it as being a, a donation, but more of a commissioning of work or a commissioning of impact that they would like to see. Um, and as part of that, they're looking for evidence. Okay, so it's not just, hope you do something nice with my donation. It's actually, you know, they are trying to um, deliver evidence to their stakeholders that, that the money that's been committed into the open source ecosystem has actually produced a net benefit. And actually, I was recently asked to review a, a paper that um, was speaking about how that, could, how that impact was actually measured, because that's not, it's, it's not very mature as a, as, a, as a practice, and that's still something that's being worked on. And actually, um, the Sovereign Tech Agency is one of the groups that has invested in FreeBSD project. And um, uh, part of our work with them is to help them figure out how, it's, how best to measure impact of investments. So they ask for a lot of um, feedback on lessons learned as well as impact delivered. Um, so just to speak a bit more about the investment sources that uh, we've been engaging with, um, you may be, you may have met Greg potentially, Greg Wallace. Um, he was hired last year into the foundation. Uh, he was with us for a, a year and a bit, perhaps a year and a half. Um, and he did a lot of work to develop partnerships and to seek potential investors through those partnerships, whether they be um, um, commercial partners or NGO slash government partners. Um, and so three of the investments that are particularly noteworthy that came in through his work are we had an investment from Quantum Leap Research, who are the, the main investor apart from the foundation into the laptop project. So they've given $250,000 into the laptop project and the foundations are given 500. Then we've also had the Sovereign Tech Agency, <laughs> um, which has given, it was 600 and some in, in euros, but it basically comes to around over $700,000, which is sizable. And then we had Alpha Omega, um, who funded some, some security-based projects, and that was around 138,000. So what, even though these have all come from slightly different sources, um, they've all been tied to outcomes uh, that we, we've agreed up front what those outcomes will be. So I'll tell you a little bit more about each one of these. Um, Alpha Omega, I won't be going on to say any more about, but Quantum Leap Research, um, which is the laptop one, and Sovereign Tech Fund, which is the infrastructure modernization I will be saying more about. Um, so Alpha Omega, uh, as mentioned, is a, I don't know whether this is the exact right use of the term NGO, but it is a non-governmental organization. Its funds have come from hyperscalers, so we've got AWS, Microsoft, and Google funding that. And their focus is on um, making sustainable security improvements in open source projects. Um, the work that they commissioned from us uh, were two things, a code audit, which was discussed yesterday on uh, the Beehive Hypervisor and Capscom Sandbox, also a process audit. And that project started in roughly the beginning of June uh, and will finish roughly around December, but there are some extra bits that we'll probably do to um, follow on from that. And that, that project, um, all the information about that project can be found on the OpenSSF um, GitHub repo, and there are monthly public um, reports that we write that can be found there. 
Um, okay, so Quantum Leap Research is a private company. So it's based out of the US and does a lot of um, work with government agencies. That's, a, that's about as much as I think that they wanted to share with us. Um, so they don't talk much about their work publicly, but the, the laptop um, usability for FreeBSD is important to them. So they chose to, to, to make an investment on the condition that we would spend it particularly on laptop usability. Um, uh, the, the, thing, the key things, and I will talk more about exactly what's in the project, but the key things are contemporary Wi-Fi, which I know is one of the top asks for, for laptop users, full audio, suspend and resume, which I know is another one of the key things, and other identified features, you'll find out. Um, then we're looking at the Sovereign Tech Agency. As I mentioned before, it's a, it's a government body, and we see that there are... Um, other governments who are doing similar, not identical projects. I think the Netherlands is doing something similar. Um, what they're focusing on is uh, digital sovereignty. So that really means that um, individuals, industry and government are all able to um, have a choice, and particularly a choice around open source uh, for their um, so so software supply chain or, or their software stacks. And the five projects that we have with them, or five work packages, cover zero trust builds, CI CD automation, reducing technical debt, security controls, and SBOM improvements. So I will be saying a bit more about that one. So let's, uh, let's see how, how this is changing the way the foundation works. So on the left, we have sort of previous state and on the right we have where we're, where, where we're going and what we're doing to change that. So previously fundraising wasn't a sort of dedicated um, discipline within, within the foundation in, in the sense that it didn't have dedicated staff and it was something that was um, done across the foundation staff, particularly by Deb. And um, where that's changed is through Greg's input, he, he was with us for a year or more, he helped to set up um, really a model for how to go about getting these targeted investments. Um, and now that he is not in that role, we're taking those processes and then we're slotting in a new role which is based around grant writing, which is the, the main bit that we didn't have covered. Um, in terms of um, project, management or project processes, uh, sorry, project staffing. Uh, uh, we had one project manager, uh, you may know uh, Joe, and Joe was very much um, coordinating projects on the ground, so making sure that people who were or are working as contractors on specific, um, specific funded projects by the foundation, um, are they know what they're working on and they're getting on with the work and, and reporting back and things like that. So that was, um, that was where we were at um, before I joined. Now I've joined as um, technical program manager, so we have at least two dedicated project staff. And then this bottom section is relating to how is it, how are we running projects with the community? Um, and it, it was a fairly sort of... Um, Ad, ad hoc, perhaps, would be a good way of saying it. So volunteers would get involved as and when. Individual contracted developers would get, get involved as and when. And it was really just depending on what the project needed. Um, now we're moving more towards a m model for these larger projects that have uh, very kind of specific outcomes in mind that we uh, are using. We're aiming... We're not completely there yet, but we, we're getting closer to having more mixed project teams. So by that I mean that some people from the foundation are working, some contractors are working, and um, community stakeholders are working as well within those projects, which is uh, very important for our intended outcomes of, of how we want to do the work. Processes. Um, as previously mentioned, you know, we never really had specific output required from investment and the tracking um, 
spend was, was it was tracked, but it, it's fa at a fairly high level, um, like you know what money was being spent on. Um, now we're going much over to this idea of um, investment. Some of our investments, not all of them, requiring a specific output. Um, and then I've also mentioned here project accounting, which this is a little bit of a detail, but it, it for us it's a big diff, a big change in how we work because you know, tracking hours and how much time an individual person is, is spending on something is not something that was done before. But it does allow us to have a much more granular control over, um, you know, how much we're doing with the money we've got. Um, so previously, in terms of the process uh, on project management, um, projects were pr proposed by contractors and, and others, it should say, and others. Um, and usually it was one project, one co contractor. Um, now the projects are larger and more strategic um, and we're seeking ad additional investment sources so sometimes I don't think we've got any yet but we, we're looking potentially to have some projects with multiple investors um, the laptop has the foundation as one so that technically is multiple um, but we've got multi we've got these multi-domain multi and multi-contractor projects so when I start talking more about the infrastructure modernization, you'll see that it covers some disparate areas um, and no one contractor or one volunteer is likely to have all the skills required or the knowledge um, to do all of those. And then we're also including third party suppliers as well because sometimes it's, um, it's quicker or, or you, you know, it comes as a um, it comes with its own sort of project management to, to hire us, you will probably all use suppliers to, to have someone to come in and, and actually just deliver on, on a, a piece of work that you need doing. And that will make more sense when I start to give you an example. Um, in terms of engaging the community, so yes, project updates certainly have been happening and, and you will have seen those. And they may well have been coming out through marketing channels, which is, is absolutely fine, of course. Um, the transparency of the proposal process and the ongoing work has not necessarily always been clear to everybody and that is something that we've had feedback on and, and we want to, you know, we're working towards making that more transparent. Um, we now have more process around reporting on these funded projects monthly um, because pretty much all of our contracts require us to do that. That is a really great um, launch pad for us to be able to then share to everyone who has an interest because we're already giving updates so we can just take those updates and then share them more widely. Um, we are making a point to include as much as possible and as early as possible the um, FreeBSD admin teams and I'm talking about teams like core, source manager, port manager, sec team, um, release engineering, um, you know, all, all the team, all the teams um, on the steering calls. So we're having, you know, like bi-weekly steering calls for these projects just to make sure that we're not working in a vacuum with our contractors, but we're actually um, ensuring that somebody who's um, representing the project has, has a, a view of what's happening and is involved in decision making. And then the other thing that we're doing um, is supporting um, the working groups, which does relate to these projects um, because that's that's where we tend to get the wider view of where these projects are fitting in. Um, so it's not just relying on those admin, those admin teams to, to give us the view of the project and what's what what's needed, but also um, working with these working groups. Okay. Um, so the f the first project to talk about is infrastructure modernisation. Um, it was difficult to come up with a name for the project that really said a lot and was short when we had so many different things in it. So hopefully infrastructure modernization sort of covers it. Um, it started this year in August, so it's, it's not been going too long. It's running for just over a, a year um, and it'll be um, finishing up approximately September next year. As mentioned, the investor and they don't like to be called donors, they like to be called invest investors. Um, it's a sovereign tech agency, I did change it there. Um, objectives are to 
as you can see, up-level hygiene and security tooling of base and ports and packages, to modernize the project's infrastructure to accelerate development cycles, to improve build security, to streamline the onboarding of new developers. So these are not necessarily what you would call kind of technical. They, they are technical. <laughs> you need to be technical to do the work, but they're not, they're not focusing on like a particular subsystem or, or the source code necessarily. It's more about um, making sustainable um, changes to the way that we do some things. Um, and then the, out, the output is, I think I mentioned that before, but you can see technical debt reduction and so on. These letters are the um, identifiers for the work packages. So we have work package A, work package B, work package C. So you might see those referred to a little, um, a little more as we go along. So how did we get, how did we get them to, to give us the money? Um, so this probably took over a year to do. So I think it was last year that we started engaging with them. They had an open call for proposals. This is the picture that they had on their website. And um, it was a two-round process, which doesn't sound so bad, but um, they, they had some very clear ideas of, of how they wanted us to make the proposals to them. So they, they assigned us a project manager very early on. And it was essentially a, a collaborative process to put that together as a proposal. Um, and one thing that was very um, notable about this investment is that there was very much a time, a budget, and an output. So it, if you've been involved with any kind of project management or, or, or any kind of project like this before, you'll know that this is, this is um, you know, you, you can't just hope for the best. You kind of have to have a plan when you're going to go into something like this. Um, and they've also given us defined areas of impact. So th th it's a little bit small, this text, I'm sorry, um, but I couldn't compress it because it's the exact contract wording. And I wanted to give you a sense of um, how we're looking at ownership of outcomes. So the Sovereign Tech Agency is not necessarily a user of FreeBSD. It might be, I haven't asked. Um, but what they want, so we're not working, we're not delivering something to them that we hand over and they say, thank you, it works perfectly, of course. Um, you know, we'll come back to you if there's any bugs. What, what they're doing is they're investing in the ecosystem, in the digital infrastructure ecosystem to make it better for everyone. And so they have come to us to ask, what, what can you do with money to make, it to make that overall better? So... Um, we proposed the things that aligned with their goals that would also align with our goals. And we, um, we came up with these, this contract wording that was actually very high level. And if you've ever seen a specification for a project, it's normally more than one slide, right? particularly if it's going to be sort of this amount of money spent. Um, what this means is that we have a lot of... Um, um, what's the word? Latitude. We have a lot of latitude to decide how to make that impact and to work with the project to decide how to make that impact. So we have, um, we, have a, we do have a few things. Um, so it says perform bug triage and re remediation, document patches and fixes, develop a comprehensive issue management program, assess and implement issue management tools and technologies. They're somewhat specific, but it really doesn't say like how many bugs we, sh we have to close or uh, in, what, in which system. Um, it doesn't say, you know, what comprehensive means. It doesn't say what issue means. It doesn't say what management <laughs> means. So it, it's very much, um, as, long as, as long as we can demonstrate that it's been valuable, and it's within these areas, then, it, then the outcomes are ours to define, okay? Um, okay. So just a little um, calendar for you, a Gantt chart, um, where we see, uh, we started with A, <laughs> we started with work package A, 
And um, that started in August and, and will commence by the end of December. Um, and then all of the other ones are next year. So we have B and C that are starting in January. And then we have um, D and E for the two months after that, which is going to be quite a lot by the time we get into sort of April, May. It's going to be quite busy. <coughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to speak a little bit about how we are managing this project um, and how we decided how to manage this project. So we've got, um, you can see, I think, the arrows of inputs and outputs. So when I was thinking about how are we going to manage this, this project, like what's an appropriate methodology? And I'm not, you know, like I'm, I'm not a, a trained project manager, okay? I'm a... I learned on the learnt on the ground. Um, so methodology is not like my big thing, but I, I'm interested in systems and, and how they work. So the inputs that we had were really what we got from the investor and what we thought would be the right thing to do. So we knew that we had to give monthly reporting and we knew that we had to say what we'd done and what we'd learned. And we knew that we had to have predictable billing because we'd already said how we were going to bill them and how much every month. And we knew we had to do timesheets because that was contractual. Um, and we knew that we had, we'd already agreed to like when the work packages would be delivered, so we had those dates, and that was, an out, that was something that we had to deal with. Um, then we also have these goals of, well, it actually has to be meaningful. It can't be a tick box, tick box exercise because who benefits? Um, it's probably even more harm than good, than good to do that. We wanted to make sustainable impact, so obviously we, don't, we just don't want to, to do something that then get, gathers dust and nobody ever sees the benefit of it. It, it wants to be something that uh, contributes to ongoing uh, benefits. And then it was really important that we have as much collaboration uh, as needed with the FreeBSD project itself. And so what we decided uh, we would do is to have a milestone-driven pro project methodology, which obviously with the work packages is what we needed, but also to have this close collaboration with the project. So I mentioned before we've got these bi-weekly steering calls um, for uh, work package A, because it's specifically about um, technical debt and bugs and things. That was mainly with the source manager team. Uh, for the other work packages, it'll be other teams. Uh, and we've got the foundation staff as well in there. We've chosen to go down the path of mixed resourcing. So um, we've got the source manager team um, actually doing some of, some of this work as well. Then we've got um, Moin, who is a, one of our um, full-time staff who was recently moved over from being contract to full-time role with us. Uh, and then we've also engaged an analytics specialist called Baturja, who essentially um, only really do open source project work. Uh, open source project health work. So, uh, and then in terms of other processes that are new, internally I mentioned project accounting. Um, so, just to give you a flavor, this is, this is work package A, it's the only one that we're, we're um, in flight with on this particular project. So, our approach was to collaborate with the source manager team and to jointly develop strategies. So, we, we approached the team and asked them, you know, this is what broadly what we would like to, to do. Like, how would you suggest approaching it? Um, so we worked with them to develop the strategy. And one of the things that they asked for immediately was we just need to better understand that, that backlog of issues in Bugzilla. Um, so we've, we worked with Biturgia. We appointed Biturgia to help us with that. Um, and then... As, as I mentioned, source manager really wanted to be able to understand the bug backlog. So that we've stood up a, an open source software project called Grimoire Lab, which is, uh, takes in the, the um, data from Bugzilla and uh, uh, present, allows you to query it and, and present it in, according to um, understand uh, what you're doing with the bug, bug backlog and, and particular characteristics of it and how you're managing it. Um, and then we've created, or the, essentially the um, source manager team has created a new bug triage and remediation process, process which 
is developing as we, as we speak. Um, in terms of achievement, um, working so closely with Source Manager has, has given us a good level of transparency at that level. And I know that when I was at EuroBSD Con, transparency was something that particularly the core team was asking for for from the foundation, and I know the developers were asking for from core. So it's all over, everyone wants more transparency. So this is, this is one place where we're, we're working towards having more. Um, we've achieved having a, a project-directed strategy, which is really important. Um, and then the new tooling is, is now available for understanding those issues. Um, that's been customized for the FreeBSD project and all the source manager team have had training on how to use that. Also because, um, I think I've said it, no, I didn't say it. Um, it's, we are hosting on FreeBSD, so it, and it's completely um, open source and customizable by us, and there's a community of users on, on that project as well for anything we may wish to do in the future. And, and also we were able to offer um, Moin's time and help on supporting the source manager team with that. Um, challenges, yes, we've definitely had some challenges. Um, it was quite a rush to get the project started because the project started the day we, we signed the contract and, and I think with hindsight, like we probably should have had a bit more breathing space, but it, it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been a gr great doing it like that, but it's been, it's been all right, it hasn't, it hasn't crashed. Um, we didn't have formal processes for, for s selecting a supplier when we selected Viturgia. So that was a little bit slower because we had to sort of spin up a quick process to help with that. Um, project accounting is, is a new muscle that we're having to, to create uh, and train. And, you know, the foundation is resource constrained and so is the project. And, you know, just asking people to, to give up more time to work on this stuff. Um, yeah, it, it, people just don't always have it. Um, but, but as always, people have been very generous with their time. So it, it's been very very good um, so let me just okay um, so let me just say a little bit about Grimoire Lab I won't go into this in too much detail but um, we'll be following up um, with some some more kind of um, information about this for anyone who's interested um, as we start to get um, get to grips with it and the source manager team feels um, more confident with it um, but we have some dashboards that are essentially showing, this one shows um, the backlog and whether it's going up or down and, and things like um, backlog management in, management index, which is like the um, what does it say? efficiency and closing issues. So it, 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 there are some, some ways of thinking about how you manage your back, backlog. Um, and then you've got some other um, uh, d dashboards here about um, uh, how long bugs have been open and things like that. So these are five dash dashboards that were requested and specified by source manager team that Bitergio created and that have n has now been handed off to us on an open source platform. Um, so they're going to be using them for things like um, uh, bug uh, triage sessions, community bug triage sessions and uh, creating um, guides on how to, to do bug triage and management for anyone to follow. Um, so what's next? We have two more work packages. Um, they're both due to start in January. One is Zero Trust Builds, one is CI CD Automation. Um, so we've, because we had a little bit more lead time on these two, we're actually starting before the project starts to, um, to plan up on, on what the scope will be and how we're going to approach it so that we can start to think about it if we need to uh, engage any contractors or any um, suppliers. And you can see that um, you know we've got various teams, uh, respectively, for zero trust build and CI/CD. Um, you may not have heard a huge amount about this to date. We do need to, you know, spin up a little bit more about the communication on this. Um, it, it's understood that that's that will help. Uh, we want better transparency. Um, handing over of, of that work package A, which is due to end in December, to the source managed team. Um, so they can they can own that and take that on, and then work packages D and E, which are the last two, and, and they start in I think February and March or March and April. All right. Um, laptop. 
laptops. Oh, sorry, laptops. <laughs> um, so laptop usability <clears throat> is really only starting now. So I started picking up this project just, I mean, just a few weeks ago, to be honest with you. So it's quite, it's very much everything's getting spun up at the same time. And I should have had that gift with the plates, you know. Um, the, invest, the source of investment for this is um, the FreeBSD Foundation that's um, investing half a million dollars and Quantum Leap Research, which is investing 250,000. Um, the actual whole project scope was estimated at a million, so we're a little short of everything that we wanted. Uh, so we think probably some of the scope that I show you will have to be de-scoped or it'll just sort of happen you know, along the way, depending on how the money goes. Um, our objective is, is to allow FreeBSD to run out of the box on a broad range, that's not very specific, of personal computing devices. Um, and you'll see in a minute, but we are, we are going to make a list of things. Um, and then the output will cover Wi-Fi, audio, suspend and resume, graphics, Bluetooth, and other things, which is a, uh, just a, a list of um, other bits and pieces that don't necessarily fall into a category. Or they have a category each, maybe. Um, and the initial use cases is broadly uh, for developer users. So how did we get the investment? Um, so we actually just received a cold email from, from QLR. Um, and they just sent it info at, and it was, I think it was just like a really short email saying, hi, interested in laptops, Would you, uh, can we chat? Um, and so that's how that conversation got started. Um, as mentioned, uh, Quantum Leap Research has long-term plans that involve FreeBSD and laptops. <laughs> and um, after some discussion, um, it was, it sort of became clear that this would be a great opportunity for the foundation to accelerate that investment by adding additional funds into it. Um, the, the, the roadmap is not really time-based like the other one was, um, and it's not, um, it's not really milestone-based per se, but it's much more functionality-based. So it's much more like product development than it is um, project management. Luckily, I've been a product manager as well, so that's fine. Um, so what we're trying to solve for is obviously monthly reporting because people want to know, hey, I gave you some money, what's happening? <laughs> um, but actually, Quantum Leap Research, you know, because they, they will be a user of laptops, they are much more of a long-term partnership. So they are not necessarily um, just looking for this all to be delivered in, in like according to a certain time and according to a certain um, spec. They're they just want to know that it is being invested in and it is progressing over time. Um, and I, actually, I think they're interested in seeding um, a focus on laptops. So our goals are to have regular delivery of laptop functionality, which means not just working, working, working for two years and then, hey, we did this, what do you think? Um, which you know, is a recipe for you know, people to, to, to feel um, like they, they, yeah, they just have to wait a long time and weren't involved. Uh, we also wanted to have a high level of transparency to users and uh, developers. And we also wanted to have high situational awareness of the FreeBSD user and developer needs. So we don't have the whole picture. Nobody has the whole picture. We want to do as much as we can to build that picture over time. We probably don't have all the information right now. And we also want to have good coordination because there are so many different parts of, of FreeBSD that have to be looked at to get laptop usability um, that um, you know, there are multiple technical work streams that need to be coordinated. Um, so the decision there was to tackle this using, um, I hope I'm not going to traumatize anyone by mentioning Agile. Um, it's got a small A, so it's less uh, threatening. But <laughs> we have, um, we'd, essentially we're going to do monthly iterations with our contractors just to say, can you, can you deliver something that you can do with a laptop that you couldn't do before in a month and just deliver a small thing every month from each or from several of the, the work streams. Um, we're, we're looking to have user stories as the prime, 
Oh, I need to speed up. Primary work definitions. <laughs> Um, that just means that it has a usability focus or a user-centered focus. So we know why we're doing something, and we're, we're not just testing that a, a, uh, some a functionality is now now there, but that actually fits into the um, way that you want to use it. Um, and then the other thing is to work in the open, and that means having a public roadmap. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the laptop and desktop working group, um, and then have regular reporting. Okay. Um, so I'll just skip through that one because it's, it's already been mentioned, but I'll give you a moment just to absorb um, some of the candidate items, which is probably the slide that you've just been waiting this whole talk to look at, right? Um, but here are some of the potential candidate um, items that will be included in this project. That's by kind of by agreement or, or, or by consultation to some degree. Um, we're not, we don't want to necessarily say that we know everything about what's needed for laptops, but we want to make sure that as we're working, we're working in the open and listening to, to the input that we're getting. Um, so how far have we got? We have this, this roadmap, which has, it's in GitHub. It's not public yet, but we're working on it because um, not all of these are quite ready. Um, but maybe in the next month or so, we'll be trying to get those to go live. Um, creation of a laptop and desktop working group. Um, that's to start next month. So do get involved with that, and I'll put some details up in a minute. There are some things that we want to work in in November that we, um, we've already identified, and, and we already have some contractors to work on that. Um, so here's the details of the laptop and desktop working group. Um, if you already know about the mailing list, there's the FreeBSD desktop working group, uh, sorry, desktop mailing list, um, which you can certainly, if you join the mailing list, you'll know about when the first meeting is. Um, and obviously, we, we're still in the process of spinning this project up, but we'll be refining user stories, setting, oh, did you use the capital A for Agile there? Um, Agile working practices, uh, communications and accounting to come. Hey, how many minutes for questions? One? <laughs> Negative three. Oh, dear. I thought I was going to be under time, so I was just, you know, relaxing. Um, did anyone have a question? Okay. Ross? How am I going to collect the user stories? So user stories um, are... Being, when I say user stories, I'm not necessarily talking about use, like case studies of individual users out there and uh, tell me about your story. User stories are, I'm, I'm describing in an agile management sense. So it's as a developer, I want to be able to connect to Wi-Fi using modern standards so that I can use my laptop. <laughs> So that, that's the sort of structure of user stories. How we're collecting them is we're just, we're expanding them out of those kind of five or, or six areas that we know we need to cover. Um, having said that, they, they will be developing over, over time and we'll be breaking those down, you know, uh, uh, with advice and input from, from various um, quarters. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, somebody had a hand up and it went away. But maybe it was the same question. Oh, hey. Did you have a question? Uh, so the question is, if there's people that, who are interested in doing things, who should they talk to? I would very much recommend coming to the working group. Um, and do you mean pe paid or, do you mean, or volunteers or paid? Paid. Oh, in that case, I would say um, you can speak with me or Ed. It's probably your best bet. Yeah. Cool. Do we have more time for questions or is that is that kind of it? One more? Yeah. Are any of the drivers for neural processing units for machine learning? Uh, I do not know the answer to that. I'm thinking probably no, but I'm looking at Ed.
so the answer was nothing specifically in scope, but we could we can look at it potentially. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So we're going to break for lunch. So we'll be back here. I think when's the next one? An hour. So one thirty. Thank you all. <laughs>